Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forevermore. Amen. Well, a very uh, warm uh, evening to all of you, and a very good one. I'd like to welcome you all for another Bible preach. All right, guys, tonight um, we're going to continue our topic, which we have been doing for the last few weeks, which was the miracles, the seven miracles in the Gospel of St. John. We are up to the sixth miracle, and tonight we will be reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 11, verses 1 to 35, inclusive. Chapter 11, John, verses 1 to 35. Here we go. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, his sick, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and you are going there again. Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. These things he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought uh, that he was speaking about taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Then Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. And many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Now Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would, have, would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. And when she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary, his sister, saying, The teacher has come and is calling for you. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews, who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, she is going to the tomb to weep there. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned into the, in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. 
Jesus wept, and glory be to Christ our Lord forever. Amen. Uh, my beloved, we said that the Gospel of John, St. John, contains seven miracles, and St. John calls them signs. These seven signs, we said, just a small intro, we said that these seven signs, each sign takes up three chapters. The first chapter is an introduction to the sign. The second chapter is the sign itself or the miracle. And the third chapter is the result of that miracle or that sign that Jesus performed and did. So, seven signs. Each sign contains three chapters. Three times seven, twenty-one. And this is the Gospel of St. John, 21 chapters. And these, and these seven signs are the seven sacraments of the true church of Jesus Christ. The first sign was the wedding of Cana, where the Lord Jesus changed the water into wine. And that sign is the holy baptism, one of the seven sacraments in the church. The second sign, where the Lord Jesus heals the royal's official son. The royal's official son. And that is the sacrament of confession. Believing in the word of Jesus Christ. Confess. And when you confess to your Lord everything you have done and believe in the word that is salvation to you, then you are saved and you have eternal life. Confession is the second sacrament. The third sign, healing a man of Bethesda. For 38 years he was paralyzed. Jesus came to him and he said, get up, take your bed and go home. That is uh, a sacrament which is anointing of the sick. The fourth sign where the Lord Jesus feeds um, the multitude, 5,000 men, not including women and children, with five loaves of bread and two fishes. That is another sacrament in the Holy Church of Jesus Christ, which is the Holy Eucharist, the body and the blood in the truth of Jesus Christ. And the fifth one, opening the eyes of the blind men who was born blind from the womb of his mother. In John chapter 9, verses 1 to 7, and Jesus opened his eyes by spitting on the ground, making some mud and putting it on his face. And he says, go to this pond of water called Shilucha in Hebrew, which means the sent one or the messenger. And when he went and washed, he regained his sight. And regaining the sight is another sacrament, which is the anointing of the holy oil, the confirmation, the sacrament of confirmation. Holy baptism is two stages. Baptized in water and confirmed by anointing of the oil on you, which the oil represents the Holy Spirit. Anointing is the work of the Holy Spirit. You are baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You receive the Holy Spirit of God. And that Holy Spirit to remain in you forever, you are confirmed. The second stage of the holy baptism, anointing of the holy oil, is opening of the blind man's eye. And tonight, my beloved, is the sixth sign and the sixth sacrament of the seventh. And that is raising Lazarus from the dead. What do we learn from this? Raising Lazarus from the dead is chapter 11 in the Gospel of John. If you look at the Gospel of John chapter 10, before 11, and obviously chapter 12 after 11, we come to chapter 10. What do we see in chapter 10? We see in chapter 10 the famous chapter where the Lord Jesus talks about the shepherd and the sheep. And in chapter 10 he says, I am the good shepherd, and I come, I came to lay down myself or my life for my sheep. I came down to put my life for my sheep. And while he was saying that I came to give my life for you guys, my sheep, i.e. those who believe in Jesus Christ, the Christians, or those who accept Jesus and become Christians. He came to die for us. And He came to die for the whole world. 
As John 3.16 says, And so God loved the whole world that He gave His only begotten Son. So Jesus died for the whole world. So He came to give His life for everyone who accepts this sacrifice. And then, if you read at the end of chapter 10, the Jewish priests and the Pharisees and the scribes, as usual, they went against Him and they said, Who do you think you are? And they wanted to stone Him to death. So he ran away, he ran away from the Jerusalem area or region into where? Into the wilderness. And while he was, he ran away with his disciples. The disciples would have probably thought and they would have said, but Lord, you were saying that I came down to lay myself for you guys. I came to die for you to have life. And now the Jews came to kill you, you ran away. So that doesn't make sense. If you came to die, then why are you running away when they want to kill you? Well, he was not running away in the sense that he was afraid of dying because he came to die. But he went because his hour of the cross had not come yet. That's why they could not have laid any hand on him or stoned him. His hour had not come yet. No one can touch Jesus unless he permits you to touch him. No one. Because he's God and he's in control of everything. He's in control of everything. So he ran away for our sake. To what? To show us that when I'm going to run away, I'm going to come back for the very thing that I was talking about. I am the shepherd who lays his life for his sheep. So a message came to him. They said, your friend Lazarus is not feeling well. Jesus said, let us remain a couple of more days. Let us remain a couple of more days. And then the word came that he is extremely ill. And the Lord waited two more days and then he turned to the disciples and he said, let us go and I want to go and wake up Lazarus. And then the disciples said, Lord, but you just ran away a couple of days ago from the Jewish people. They wanted to stone you to death. How come you want to go back there again? We don't understand. One, one day you say, I came to die for you. And then when they want to kill you, you run away. And then now you want to go back to the very people who wanted to kill you. So what's going on? But Jesus was pointing one thing. That when I took you out, I wanted to show you that what I said, I meant every word. That I am the shepherd who lays his life for his sheep. And that death. I'm pointing now to Lazarus. Lazarus represents the whole human race. We are all Lazarus. We are all dead. Why? Because since Adam broke God's word, sin entered and the wage of sin is death. And everyone died the moment Adam broke God's word. All of us died. And what does death mean? Separation from God. Death means separation from God. Because if God meant the physical death, then if we read in the book of Genesis, we see that the Lord God said to Adam, He said, Adam, the moment you eat from this tree that I forbid you to eat from, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God said to him, to Adam, He said, the moment you eat from the tree, Surely you shall die. Well, Adam ate from the tree and he lived 930 years after eating from that tree. He did not die the physical death straight away. God said, if you eat, you die. But Adam ate and lived 930 years. So the Lord God, when he refers to death, he, when he refers to death, he refers to the spiritual death, not the physical. Otherwise, Adam would have died physically on the spot the moment he ate from the tree. But did Adam die instant, uh, 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 immediately the moment he ate from the tree? Yes. 
He died immediately, not physically, spiritually. The moment he ate from the tree, spiritually he was dead. And what is the spiritual death? The separation of our spirit from the Creator himself, from God. This is the true death, when we are separated from God. So Jesus came to give us that life, i.e. to reunite us with God, to give us that connection again with God, which we lost through the former Adam. The latter Adam, who is Jesus, the Good Shepherd, he said, I came to lay my life down for you to live, i.e. to go back and be united with God. So now he said, I'm going to wake up Lazarus. They said, Lord, well, these people, they want to kill you. If Lazarus is asleep, then he is okay. He's not sick or he's not dead. So why go and wake him up? They didn't understand. But then Jesus plainly said, Lazarus, our friend, is dead. It is the first time in the gospel that death is referred to as sleep. It is the first time in the gospel that death is referred to as sleep. Usually, it's death. But Jesus here, he says, he is asleep. Why? Because he who believes in Jesus Christ can never die, can only sleep. He who believes in the Lord Jesus, death can never overcome him or her. That is why, my beloveds, the church fathers, when they come and talk about those who leave this world, they refer to them as the departed souls, not dead. It is wrong to say to a Christian, they died. Very wrong. Because if you say to a Christian person who received the baptism, the sacraments of the Lord Jesus, who believed in the name of the Lord Jesus, who had the name of the Lord Jesus on him, on, on her, how can you say they died? And the living Messiah is our Lord and Savior. We can never say to someone, Christian, they are dead. Because if I say they are dead, then I'm just telling myself I don't, have, I don't have hope in resurrection. I don't have hope of eternal life. It's the end. I'm dead. I'm gone. I'm finished. So what we refer to the Christian people who, who die, we say they departed. And departure, who departs? Can a dead person depart? Because departure requires for you to get up, to walk, to go and come. So only the living can go and come and walk. A dead person can't walk. So who depart? Who flies? You know, when you, when you go overseas, you need to go to the airport and depart from the airport, yeah? But when you depart from Sydney Airport, are you dead? You're not dead. You're a living person in the plane going to another country. So Christians depart from this airport called this world and they fly home the kingdom of God, paradise at the moment. The third heaven. So only the living depart. So our friend Lazarus is asleep. Yes, very true. Because if you believe in me, you will sleep. You won't die. And when you sleep, you will wake up 100%. Even though you got sleep for a few hours, but you will wake up, you're not dead. But those who look at you, they think you're dead. But you're not. And one proof, you are not dead when you're asleep, even if you are not making any movements. You have dreams, don't you? If you were dead, you wouldn't have seen dreams. You wouldn't have seen visions. That is a solid proof that there is no death. There is the other life. And those dreams and visions, sometimes, not always, but sometimes they come from the other life, where Jesus is. So just like when you go to sleep, you, you say to yourself, I'll go and sleep and I'll see you tomorrow. You believe that you're going to wake up. Then why are you losing hope for someone to die to say they're dead and they're finished? No, they're gone to sleep and they're going to wake up. Jesus will wake them up. I'm going to wake up Lazarus. Very easy. To a Christian, it's very easy. It's very simple because Jesus made it easy. 
He came to give us life and an abundant one too. So now, the Lord is going back to wake up Lazarus from the dead, from his sleep. In this story, in this story, there is a place called Bethany. And this Bethany, this, this town, in this Bethany, there are three people in this story. There is Martha, there is Mary, her sister, and there is Lazarus, their brother. Bethany, the town, Martha, the oldest sister, Mary, the second oldest, and Lazarus, the little boy. He's the youngest of the family. He's the youngest of the family. What do we learn from these names? What do we learn from these names? What do they tell us about us? About us. We said we are all Lazarus. We are all dead. Because we all broke God's word. And Jesus came to wake us up. He came to lay his life for us. Lay it down. Bethany, my beloved, the word Bethany means it's a Hebrew or Aramaic or Syriac. Suryoyo is a, is a Hebrew or Aramaic. The, the Hebrew language is taken from Aramaic um, or Syriac. And it's, the proper translation is Bethania. Bethania. Now, Bethania is a two word in one. Beth is house. Anya is agony, or pain, or sorrow. So Beth Anya, or Bethany, means the house of agony, the house of pain, the house of sorrow. And don't we all live in Beth Anya? Don't we all go through pain and sorrows and hurt? We are all in Beth Anya. And why are we sorrowful? Because we are all Lazarus, sinners, dead. But in this Bethania, number one is Martha. The second one is Mary. And the third one is Lazarus. Now let's come to these names. And they're all us. Martha. Martha in Aramaic, again in Hebrew. These are all Aramaic names. Martha means inheritance. The one who inherits things. In Arabic, it comes from, is, in Arabic, is Mirath, Martha, Mirath, Warath. Mirath is inheritance, someone who inherits. But Martha here represents earthly inheritance, worldly inheritance, not divine inheritance. So Martha is earthly inheritance. Mary, Maryam, is the proper translation, or the proper pronunciation, I should say. Maryam. Maryam has a lot of meanings in that name, but one of the names Maryam comes from the, a person who is the, an outlaw who, um, who goes outside the laws, who breaks the law. In Arabic, Al-Mutamarrid, disobedient, disobedient, yes. So Maryam, one of the name, one of the translation, it means the disobedient. And Lazarus, Lazarus means the one who hopes for, the one who has hope, the one who has a vision of something to come his way. I'm hoping to get this. I'm hoping to, to reach this point. I'm hoping to get to this place. Lazarus, I have hope in me that I will make it to God's kingdom. The one who has hope. So now, Martha, worldly inheritance. Miriam, the outlaw, the one who is disobedient. And Lazarus, the one who has hope. When Adam, our father, broke God's word, and Eve was the assistant to that, all the human race came from Adam and Eve. Eve, the disobedient. The disobedient who went walking in the garden alone. And Satan came as a snake and whispered in her ear. And he said, 
do you think if you eat from this tree, you're going to die? No, believe me, trust me, you're not going to die. God is very, very harsh. He's very jealous and he's very selfish. Eat because he does not want you to be like him, to know good and evil. Because God knows everything and he does not want you to know everything. If you eat from this tree, you will know everything. You'll become like God. So our mother Eve ate. The disobedient broke God's word. The disobedient race, the human race is always disobedient. Maryam. We are Maryam as the disobedient. And the Lord God said, from the very disobedient race, I will come and I will make you obedient to my daddy through me. Jesus was born of Mary. Maryam. Maryam, it's not Mary that is disobedient. No, Mary was all obedient to her son. But the, the, the name represents the human race that was disobedient. God chose from the human race and made Mary the obedient servant. And he said, through you, I will save Adam's descendants. And when he came through Mary, Lazarus, even though you are dead, all of us, even though you are a sinner, all of us, even though you are separated from God, all of us, but you know what? You have hope because the Good Shepherd is coming to wake you up. The Good Shepherd is coming back to remind you that I'm with you. Don't lose hope as long as Jesus is your Lord and Savior. Don't lose hope. Even though you are separated from God, but Jesus will search for you to bring you back to God and he reunite you. No matter what your sins are, and no matter how far you've gone and drifted away, nothing stands in Jesus' way. Nothing. Just believe. And you shall receive. Why is Martha the first? Because my beloved, as we said, Martha here represents earthly inheritance. And don't we all love to inherit the earth? I'll give you an idea what I'm talking about. Why do you get up, let's say you're working, and you have to start at 6 o'clock in the morning, so you get up at 5 maybe, and you finish, start from 6 till 4 or 5 p.m. You get up at 5 a.m. every day without fail. Tired, not tired, you get up, you go to work, you come back, you put your guts into it. Why? Because you want to inherit something at the end. It's earthly. What is that? Money. And money buys me things. Worldly things, that's my inheritance. I'm going to go, when, once I receive my wages, if you're a girl, then you go shopping and you're going to buy whatever you like. Bags, perfumes, the latest, I don't know, whatever it is that's out there in the market. Uh, Chanel and, um, and all these you know, famous names. So you go to inherit. So Martha, we are all Martha because the very first thing that we want to do is we want to inherit the earth. We want to get whatever is materialistic. So I'll pour my guts into it so I can gain a car or something. But if I ask you to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and go to the church, would you do it? 9 o'clock in the morning. Get off my case, mom. Leave me alone. I'm tired. You know what? I... I just slept. I was out all night. I just came back from clubbing, bro. You know, and I just went to sleep at 7 o'clock in the morning. And you, want me to, you expect me to go to church at 9? Man, you're so harsh. You're so cruel, mom. Have some mercy on me. Next week, mom, next, next Sunday, I promise. Why do we run to inherit earthly things and not run to inherit heavenly things? Someone owes me money. And they're going to fly tomorrow to America. Man, I don't care what time it is. I will run to their house to make sure before they go to America, they pay me my money. Would you do it? No matter what happens, you run to the church. Would you do it? No matter what happens, you get up out of your bed and read the Bible. You kneel down and you read the Bible. You are tired. It's cold, shivering. Right? And I'm extremely tired and my eyes are closing and I barely can open them. 
And are you going to force yourself to get out of that bed in that cold weather and read the Bible? No. But you will force yourself out of that bed and no matter how tired you are and run with your friends downtown King is a cross brother. I haven't slept for two days. We were hanging around. How come you are tired? You don't have time all of a sudden when it comes to Jesus. When it comes to anything to do with the Lord, sorry, I'm tired, I'm busy. You know what? I'd love to come. Believe me, trust me, I swear. Don't swear. <laughs> Don't swear. <laughs> trust me, you know what? You know how much I love to go to church, but no time, bro. The same minute, let's go out. Yeah, I've got all the time under the sun. Let's go, brother. Because we are Martha. Martha came first. Read it. Later on, go home and read these verses. Martha is number one. You see, the Holy Bible, the Holy Spirit, is not wasting His time and our time to tell us names. When He tells us names and places, He's trying to teach us something divine, something spiritual, something that is of benefit to us, to implement in our life. He said, Martha is you. Number one is Martha. Second is Mary. Why is second Mary? Even though she is the disobedient one, because you know what happens? Because when you are after the worldly inheritance, you're going to be disobedient to the divine inheritance. It's very simple. It's very, you know, straightforward. And it's logical. When your thought is this world, obviously you're not going to think of the next world. When your thought is material, materialistic things, you're not going to think about spiritual things. When your thought is about singing, definitely you're not going to pray and praise the Lord. You're going to sing like the people of the world sing. And it's all nothing but a waste of time and breath. So what? Her or his voice is beautiful. And I paid $200 just to sit at the front, or a thousand bucks, so I can go to the stadium and see whoever, singer. I don't want to mention names. But Jesus invites us all for free. Yet I don't have the time to come for free. Yet I have the time to go and listen to someone singing, and I pay money. Because we are Martha. And because we are Martha, then we became Mary, the disobedient to God and everything that is divine. And what happened because we were disobedient? We broke His law, so we died. We are all Lazarus. But it is the infinite mercy of God that did not leave us rot in the grave. I am the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. Lazarus is all humanity died and rotted in the grave but my mercy came to save you i'm going to wake up lazarus a piece of information by the way guys bethany was about two miles away from jerusalem because for a jew person not to break the law cannot walk on a on a sabbath more than two and a half miles Jesus never broke nothing. <laughs> Even going from one town to another, he, he made sure everything is by law. You cannot walk on a Sabbath more than two and a half miles. It was about two miles, less than two and a half miles. So he didn't break. But you see what happened when Jesus came. The good shepherd who lays his life down for his sheep. When Jesus came... He said, remove the rock. There was a big rock on the face of the tomb. He said, remove the rock. Why? Because I came to exchange with you. There's a, there's a, there's a deal I came to do with you. I came to exchange. I came so that life comes out of me and goes into you, Lazarus. And death comes out of you and comes into me, Lazarus. The one who is the living came to die and the one who was dead to live in Jesus Christ. There was an exchange at the, at the tomb of Lazarus. Life came out of Jesus and entered Lazarus and death came out of Lazarus and entered Jesus Christ. In our church, we call it the Friday of Lazarus. We believe that Jesus rose Lazarus from the dead on Friday. And the following Friday, a week from Lazarus was raised, Jesus was nailed on the cross and died 
and went unto the tomb in the place of Lazarus. So Lazarus being raised meant Jesus had to go into the tomb and die in his place. Savior and Redeemer. Jesus is Savior and Redeemer. Savior means I'm a sinner and Jesus washed away my sins. That's Savior. What is a Redeemer? A Redeemer means Jesus took away my sins and took my place as well. Not only washed away my sins, but he became sin for us, the sinners. That is a Redeemer. A Redeemer is the one who saves you and swaps you your place. So therefore a Savior says, your sins are forgiven, go home. A Redeemer says, come, you are my son. Now Jesus came at the tomb. What happened there? There are 35 verses, read them at home at your pace and read them thoroughly and read the Bible every day, please. Make it a habit, not a habit. Make it part of your life. Make it your life. Read the Bible every night or every day. Don't let a day pass by without you reading the Bible, even if it's a few verses. Read. Okay, let's read from the start. And now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. When Jesus, when the, when the Holy Spirit came to talk, it says, a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of who? Mary. And her sister Martha. So now, the town is referred to Mary. And Martha is referred to Mary as well. Are you with me? The town is referred to the town of Mary and her sister Martha. So Martha and the town is referred to Mary. But Martha is the oldest. Mary is the second oldest. You see, it should have been um, the town of Martha and Mary, her sister. But when it came to give us not earthly inheritance, but spiritual inheritance, then Mary comes first. Why? What happened? Because Mary, it says in here, that it was Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair. That it was Mary when the Lord Jesus went into their house Martha was very busy in the kitchen. And who was sitting at the feet of the Lord? Mary. And then Martha said, Lord, can't you see my sister sitting and I'm so busy in the kitchen? Lord, please, can you tell her like she's very, very ignorant? And she thought that the Lord was going to back her up and say, Oh, yes, come on, Mary, are you blind or something? Why don't you go, go and help your sister? That's, that's very shameful. What did the Lord say? The Lord said, Martha, Martha, I see you very troubled and in, in chaos. One thing is required, and Mary has chose the good portion that no one can take away from her. Martha, you are troubled. But Mary sat at my feet in absolute peace and silence. This is the portion that everyone should choose. Do not choose worldly things. Don't be Martha. Choose heavenly things. And what are heavenly things? Jesus Christ and everything that goes with Jesus. Mary chose heavenly things. Mary chose divine things. Mary chose the good portion, Jesus Christ. That is why everything is referred to Mary. Everything is attached to Mary. Even though Martha is the oldest, but... It is not by you being the oldest, it is by you being number one, by choosing the number one, who is Jesus Christ. If you choose Jesus, then you have everything. But if you don't do, choose Jesus, and even if you gain the whole world, you've got nothing. Because when the Spirit leaves the body, what have you gained? Absolutely nothing. Everything that you've earned is gone with the wind. So that's why Bethany... And Martha will refer to Mary because she chose the good portion, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. She sat at his feet. And where she anointed the feet of the Lord 
with the fragrant oil. By the way, guys, if you're not aware, the anointing of Jesus' feet took place in chapter 12. This is chapter 11. But the Holy Spirit is mentioning it before it happens. Because the anointing of the feet happened after Lazarus was raised from the dead. Because Lazarus was raised, Jesus was anointed to go into the grave. So the passion of Jesus Christ, the passion of the Lord, as the movie you saw, the passion of, of the Lord Jesus, started from the raising of Lazarus. The week of the passion started on, good, on Friday and ended up on Good Friday. The Passion Week started for, by raising uh, Lazarus. That's where the passion of the Lord started. That's where the pain started. I came for this rotted humanity in the grave by being disobedient, by breaking God's word. They all died. They're all Lazarus. I came to take this sin. I, the Holy of Holies. This is very grieving for the Lord. The light going into darkness. The holy being taking on sin. The living and the life-giving dying in the grave. It can't get any worse for Jesus. So that's where the passion started. So the anointing of the oil took place after raising Lazarus. And it's in chapter 12. But the Holy Spirit revealed it in chapter 11. Why? Guys, that, uh, that anointing oil um, is, um, is like a liquid that is very, it's, it uh, uh, has a very nice fragrance to it. It's a liquid that has a very nice fragrance to it. In the book of Psalm 45, verse 8, um, the, the, uh, King David says, 45, 8, he says, From all your garments or your clothes or your robes, Myrrh, aloe, aloes, and, and cassia comes out. He's talking about Jesus, King David, in, in Psalm 45, 8. He says, out of your clothes, in prophecy, out of your clothes comes myrrh, aloes, and cassia. These are all um, like in, uh, fragrances or frankincense or in, uh, incense. They are like... Um, what do you call them? I don't know how to say it in English. Uh, they're like shrubs. Uh, they, um, they, um, they crush them all and they make, make fragrances out of them. But what, what Mary poured on Jesus' body and feet was a fragrance that was liquidish. The others are like dust. But this particular oil that she poured on Jesus was liquid and had a beautiful, beautiful smell to it. This particular fragrance is only done on wedding days in happy occasions. Mary had preserved this oil and this oil used to be preserved in a glass container, uh, crystal had to be a crystal glass container. Why? Because this, this substance was so strong if it was to be put in any other containers, would break it. But only this crystal glass and a very expensive jar would only be able to contain this oil that is very strong. So the jar was very, 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 very expensive. And the oil was very expensive, very rare. So Mary, when she poured it, if you read in chapter 12, the disciples started, you know, talking. They said, oh, what a waste, especially Judah, Iscariot. Who, who, who sold the Lord with 30 pieces of silver. He said, what a waste of this very expensive oil could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and be given to the poor. Because it wasn't expensive. So that oil was used really for happy occasions, weddings. Now Mary and Martha were very old in age. So their, their uh, ma marriage was, uh, train was, you know, passed them by. You know, they can't get married anymore. They were old. So the youngest of all was Lazarus. He was the youngest. So Mary, she kept that oil for her brother. She said, okay, well now we are old in our 50s. It's not like the movies they show it, Mary, Ma Mary Magdalene as being young. No, 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 she was old. So um, 
we're old, but our brother is still young. He's the youngest in the family. So I'm going to keep this, this expensive oil. When he gets married, I'm going to pour it on him. But when she met Jesus, that love turned from brother Lazarus to Jesus Christ. She loved Jesus more than her brother. When you have an encounter with the Lord, there is no other love that come anywhere near Jesus' love. He, he overrides and supersedes any, any love. Because His love is so pure, you can only find it in Him alone. In this whole universe, you will only find it in Jesus. So when she met Jesus, and she had an encounter with the Lord, she said, Lazarus, I don't care if you're going to get married or not. I don't, you bring your own oil. This oil, I'm going to pour it on Jesus because He is my love. He is my happiness. And the happiness is what? He is my resurrection. So she came and poured that oil on Jesus. I am wedded to you. And in you, my Lord, I am risen from the dead. I am no longer dead. I overcame death through you, my Lord, the Good Shepherd, who laid his life down for me to bring me out of the tomb into eternal life. I'm going to get your attention to um, verse 5. Here we go. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When it came to referring things, Beth Bethany, Martha, they were referred to Mary because she chose the good portion. But when it comes to, for, to Jesus' love, it says Jesus loved Martha and what? And her sister. He didn't even mention Mary. And, La and Lazarus. So now Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. What do you think? When Jesus came to give, he gave it to the one who chose the good portion. He gave it to Mary. But when Jesus came to love, he loved Martha, the earthly inheritance, the worldly people, the materialistic people, those who are distant from God. And he loved Lazarus, who brought God's word and he's a sinner and he's dead in the grave. And he does, he does not mention the name who loved Jesus and who is so close and who has chosen Jesus to be their portion. Poured the fragrant oil. You are my portion, Lord. Why? Do you know why? The one who loves Jesus, listen to this, the one who loves Jesus and this is a comforting statement, by the way. It's a very comforting, it's a positive, it's not a negative one. The one who loves Jesus, Jesus has already placed you in the, in, the, in the center of his heart. He has hidden you. He has hidden you in the center of his heart. That's why he does not need to mention your name, because he loves you so much, he doesn't need to dwell on it. But he needs to dwell on those who are distant from him because he loves them the same. You with me? Because when Jesus died, he died for the whole world. When Jesus shed his blood, he shed it for the whole world. But some of his children have denied him. They're Martha. They've gone after this world and the pleasures and the treasures of this world. He's going to call them by the name just to say, hello, please come back. But those who are his the true child of Jesus. He won't need to mention your name because you are already his. Whatever he has, is he already given it to you? You know, in the, um, in the parable of the prodigal son, Luke chapter 15, when, when the younger son went and broke his daddy's word and he went and he destroyed everything and he came back, the father did a big banquet for that son who came back. The older son came and he started whinging. He said, Father... All these years I've been working for you and I've, I have been obedient to you, but you never gave me a goat to, you know, to have fun with my friends. And this, your son who went with, you know, bad people and did d filthy things and spent all the money that you gave him in bad and filthy things. And when he came back, you invited the whole city and you slain a big, a big um, bull for him and you made a big deal. How come you haven't, you've never done this for me? Because you are Mary. You've always been my son. 
And he said, my son, what is mine is already yours. Why are you, why are you comparing? Don't compare. But I had to do it for this, your brother, because your brother is Martha. He went after the world, but I still love him. I'm a father at the end. I am the father. I have to show more love for the lost. But for you, I don't need to because you should know me by now. You are my heart. Don't you know how much I love you? Do I really need to show it? So why are you worried and you say, how come Jesus, you do all these things for those who, are, who have denied you? And I, the one who love you and pray for you and come to your church and read your Bible and do this, and you don't listen to me, you've just lost me. You don't care about me or what? Well, do you want me to be a sinner so you love me? No, you are in my heart. You're hidden. I'm not going to mention your name because you are me and I'm you. But Martha is not me. I want her to make, I want her to be me like you because that's what I came for. Father, just like I and you are one, I want them to be one. So the ones who are him, he doesn't need to dwell on it. But he needs to dwell on those who are not him. Yeah? So now Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. Because Mary is all Jesus. So next time, don't be um, broken hearted because Jesus is not listening to me and he's listening to sinners. You know, it's like... Um, Let's say you guys, you come every day to church. I don't need to, uh, I don't need to dwell on it and say, hey, you must believe in Jesus. Hey, Allah, yeah, you already believe in Jesus, otherwise you wouldn't have come. You come every day to church, you come, you come, you receive the Holy Communion, you read the Bible, you come to Bible preach and everything. And then, and then one day someone comes for the first time and he hears Jesus for the first time or she. Let's say I'm preaching. I need to pay attention more to the one who just came for the first time. Why should you get upset if I'm spending more time with the one who just came now and not with you? You are already me. You are already with me and I'm already with you. But this person came for the first time. I need to pay attention more to that person. You with me? Jesus needs to pay attention to Martha, not to Mary. Mary is already his. But when it comes to give, mine is Mary. Martha Bethany belongs to Mary. Yes? You with me? Good. Look at this. When the Lord Jesus came, the word went to the house where Mary and Martha were sitting. Martha heard that Jesus is coming. He has not came into the town of Bethany. He was on, on, you know, outside that border of the town. Martha got up. Listen to this. Martha got up and ran to where Jesus was. The Bible says, you read it in verse 20. The Bible says she met Jesus. Martha met Jesus, verse 20. And she said, Lord, if you were here, my brother wouldn't have died. But now I still believe that whatever you pray to God, God listens to you and he will grant you your wish. He said, your brother will rise. The Lord says to her, your brother will rise. She said, yes, Lord, I know he will rise in the resurrection day, in the second coming. He said, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even though he dies, shall live. He who believes in me, even though he dies, shall live. He dies referring to what? Lazarus. Even though he dies, Lazarus shall live. And those who are alive and believe in me shall never, what? See death. Shall never see death. So he who believes in me, even though he dies, Lazarus is the dead. He's referring to Lazarus. Even though he dies, he will live. I am the resurrection. What are you talking about the second coming? I am the second coming now. <laughs> you don't need to wait. I am the resurrection of the life. He who believes, even though he dies, shall live. And those who are alive and believe in me shall never see death. You, Martha, who is alive, if you believe, you will never see death. 
She said, yes, I believe, my Lord, you are the Christ, the Son of God who came to this world. You are the Savior. You are the Christ, the Son of God who came to this world. And then Jesus goes and he says, remove the rock. And then Martha says, oh, oh hold on, Lord, one sec. What do you mean remove ro the rock? He said, didn't I tell you if you believe you will see the glory of God? Aren't we all Martha? She came. She said, Lord, if you were here, my brother wouldn't have died. All right. Not bad. Grania, Martha. But I still believe. Whoa, she goes on, man. I still believe that whatever you ask, even though he's dead, whatever you ask, God will grant you. Whoa, good stuff. He said, your brother will rise. Yes, in the, in the second coming. No, I am the, sec I am the resurrection life. I'm now. There is no death, my dear Martha. He's just asleep. I can wake him up anytime. And she said, yes, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God, who came to save the world. And then Jesus said, okay, bravo. Okay, now remove the rock so I can go and raise... La Please don't. Lord, he's been there for four days. He stinks. You know, it was customary... Uh, this fragrant oil which Mary, Magd Mary poured on Jesus, you know what it was? Uh, it was customary also when, when a Jewish person died, they used to go into that tomb because those tombs were on the side of the road and they had all like sort of uh, an opening and put a rock on it. So when they put this dead person in there, um, they would put all these spices on, on that dead person and then the last thing they would pour is this fragrance, that very expensive one, and this fragrance was liquidish. When it actually was mixed with that, that, with that powder, with that powder uh, substances, uh, and, and come some sort of an eruption happened, and vapor came out, nice fragrance. So what they did, they poured this fragrance, and they ran out of the tomb and, sh and closed it, and all, the, all this uh, like smoke came out, and a beautiful fragrance came out, so the whole tomb would be filled with nice fragrance. So whoever passes by that tomb would not smell a stinking dead person. Only fragrance comes out. Because if a Jewish person smells a stinking smell, they would say, this person is not a good person, he's going somewhere bad. That was their thought. Because they thought that a nice fragrance represents life. A stinking fragrance represents death. So they, the people of that dead person had to make sure that nice fragrance always came out of that tomb so that whoever passes by and smells the nice fragrance would say, may God bless you, may God accept you in his kingdom, may God do this for you, and may God forgive your sins. So they would pray for that dead person. So when the Lord, she said, you are the, the Christ, the Son of God who came to this world and believed in that, and he said, remove the rock. She said, no, 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 no. He's been there four days. He's rotted now. A, a stinking smell will come out. But Martha, you just said, I am, and you believed, and everything. One thing I say to you guys, when you ask of someone something, and that someone comes back and says a lot more, rest assured, they have no clue what they're saying. A person that talks a lot, you know, I said one thing, they should reply to that thing, but they go overboard. Let's, for example, I say, I like you. I like you and I love you and I die for you and you're my life and you're everything. A person like that, that exaggerates, they don't mean it. When I say one thing simple and they, came, they come back with a hundred million things, they don't believe and they don't, they don't even know what they're talking about. The Lord said, your brother will rise. She said, yeah, in the second coming, he said, I am, the, I am the resurrection and the life. Yes, you are the Christ, the Son of God. What a powerful statement. You are the Son of God. I mean, it's your God. Martha, don't say things you don't even believe in. When you go, to go, when you go and talk to Jesus, don't exaggerate. Are you with me? Because he already knows. You don't need to make it a, a big deal. Lord, you know what? I swear. Or oh, don't swear. Lord, you know what? If you do this, I oh, will never forget you. 
I will always pray. You know what? I give my life. Hey, hey, hey. Relax. Relax. Martha, don't exaggerate with your words and be a show off to me. I know what you are and I know what you're going to do. So you should have said, Lord, Martha should have said, Lord, look, I'm, I'm weak. I'm a sinner. But you know what? I trust in your mercy. Strengthen my faith. Strengthen my love. Strengthen my weakness. I don't know. My, my brother is, is dead. He's been four days in the grave. He's, he's rotted. But I, 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 can't, I can't see him be, being raised. I can't see him alive again. But Lord, please forgive my ignorance. Please forgive my weakness. Please forgive me. I'm a sinner. But I trust in whatever you say. I trust in that. Except this week, pray. I just trust in you. But I don't know what, what you're going to do. But I know you're going to do something. But don't be that confident person and say, yes, you are the one and the only. And then when it comes to the, to the crunch, <laughs> you fall short. So Jesus is, try, is testing her. Okay, open the grave. No, Lord, please don't. You're God? But no, 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 he's dead, he's rotted. Well, if you believe that he's God, do you think God is going to allow that person to rot? Where is your faith? Where is your faith? We pray, yet we are suspicious that the Lord is ever going to hear my prayer. We ask, but then I come back and say, well, I don't know if he's going to answer me back. Oh, he's, he's gone. He's taken too long. Um, you know, I'm getting really worried now. I thought it was going to happen on the spot. It didn't. I, okay, I said, I'll give you one more day, Jesus. The, 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 the next day came, nothing happened. Actually, it gotten worse. Whoa, Jesus, you know what? I'll give you maximum one week. You better come. The week goes by, nothing happens. You say, man, forget it. It's over. It's gone. <laughs> well, Lazarus was not only dead, but he was decaying in the grave. He was decaying in the grave. But it's never too late. When Jesus comes, even though you are decaying and you're stinking in the grave, Jesus can bring you out of there. No matter what kind of sinful status you are in, no matter how far you are from God, when Jesus comes, it's never too late. Everything is easy and anything. But have faith. Martha came and met Jesus. But look at this. When Mary came, when Mary came where Jesus was, the same place where Martha met him, because when Martha spoke to him and he said, I am, you know, the resurrection, and she said, yes, you are the Christ, the Son of God, who came to the world, she went back home and called Mary. said, Mary, Jesus has come, and he is calling for you. So Mary ran out. And as, you re as we read it here, and the people who were sitting at home, they saw Mary going quickly out of the house. They thought she was going to the tomb to to weep over her brother. So they went with her weeping. So Mary came. When she came where Jesus was, she bowed to the ground. She fell on the ground at his feet. The Bible says when Martha came, she met Jesus. When Mary came, she fell at Jesus' feet. Not met him. There's a huge difference. When Martha came, and what did we say, Martha? The worldly inheritance. A person who is distant from God. When I go to Jesus and I'm distant from Him, I meet up with Him. What, what, is, what does it mean meeting up with Him? Meaning, can, we, can you stand for a second? Let's say, you know, without, you know, um, may the Lord forgive us. Let's say this is Jesus, right? But yeah, He is Jesus because Jesus gave Himself for Him, so He is Jesus. So let's say I, I'm Martha here, and I came to meet, as the Bible says, she met Jesus. When you meet someone, you're talking same level. You're talking intellectually, yes? When you meet up with someone, you're talking what? Intellectually. When you meet up with someone, it is your head that talks. It is the brain, the intellect that talks. But when you fall, when you fall at someone's feet, it is your heart that talks. It is your heart. The intellect, when the intellect talks, 
There is reasoning. There is argument. There is uh, prove it to me. I'm not going to accept it. How? Where? Now? How? All questions. And you started talking like um, as if you are on the same level. The intellect is talking. But when you come and throw yourself at, his, at, his, at Jesus' feet, the heart talks. What does the heart talk? The language of tears. Not the words. The, the words of the heart are tears. And the language of the mind is words. When you use your head, don't open the grave, please. I know you're God, but please don't. I don't want to be embarrassed in front of all the Israelite people. They're going to smell my brother stink. And they, and, and you know, this is very embarrassing, Jesus. I, I know you're the Son of God, but please, please, this is embarrassing. The brain is talking. And when you use your head, what are you going to do? You're going to make a judgment. Man, I think it's impossible. All the doctors said you're going to die. Yeah, I'm going to die. Jesus, I believe in you, but I'm going to die. Because the doctor said, I'm going to die. You know, I'm 40 and I'm not married. That's it. It's too late. I will never get married. And every person under the sun tells me, your, your train has gone past you and you, know, you never get married. Jesus, you know, I've been praying. Please, Lord, bring me my Romeo or my Juliet, my way. But... Uh, but by the looks of things, it's impossible, Lord. Even if I go to Ankawa.com, I will never find one. <laughs> that is Martha. A worldly being, a materialistic being. Reasons with Jesus. Don't reason with Jesus. Jesus is God. The intellect of God is never going to be your intellect. You're nothing. He's everything. So don't put Jesus in your intelligence. Don't Limit God's power and mightiness in your power. That's impossible. Yeah, for you it's impossible. For him it's, everything is possible. So do not use your head, Martha. Be Mary. Mary came, fell at Jesus' feet, weeping, crying. She was speaking to Jesus, not words, but heartbeats. And that what Jesus adores. He melts like a candle when you communicate with him with your heart, not with your tongue. It puts him right off when the tongue talks only. It puts him right off and he will not listen ever. But when the heart talks, he melts. God melts. And he becomes so weak, he will do anything for you. You know what? Because the tongue can deceive. The heart never lies. I can twist it around and around and around in whichever way I want. And I, make it I, I can make it sound absolutely beautiful and look beautiful. But it's not what it is. But the heart never lies. Whatever you feel is exactly what... Is exactly what you're gonna uh, relay to the other person. That's why the Lord God in the Old Testament, in the book of Proverbs, He says, My son, give me your heart and let your eyes watch my ways. I am the God of hearts, not of tongues. And the Lord Jesus dealt with Martha the way she spoke to him and dealt with Mary the way she acted. With Martha, she met him and she started talking to him and Jesus talked to her back. I am the resurrection and the life. He talked to her back. Mary came, she fell at his feet and falling at someone's feet, meaning I'm putting my head under his feet or at his feet. And what is my head? My thoughts, <laughs> my intellect. Mary came and said, Lord, all my thinking, all my thoughts, all my wisdom, I put all, everything under your foot. I will not come to you using my head. I will come with the language of the heart. Tease, my Lord. I'll block this. Because you 
the way you think is not my way of thinking, and the way you act is not my way of, the way I act, and what you can do is not what I can do. So she put her head at his feet, all her wisdom and intelligence at the feet of the Lord, and she wept. And Jesus communicated to Mary the same way. Mary came weeping, Jesus wept. Jesus cried. Jesus didn't talk to Mary, but he talked to Martha. Because Martha came and met with Jesus and she spoke to him, so he spoke to her back. But Mary came and fell at his feet, worshipping. She said, your God. When you fall at someone's feet, that is, that is a, a, a posture of worship. So she's already saying, you are God and I'm worshipping you. You don't need to say things to Christ. Show it by deed. Let your deed be your faith. Let your action be your faith, not your words be your faith. Don't show your faith to Jesus with words. Show him with, with, with deed, with action. So Mary came without talking. She fell at his feet. You are God and I'm worshipping you. You are my God. That's why I fell at your feet. And I'm crying. You understand what I'm talking about, Jesus. Jesus not, did not say one word to Mary. But what did he do? He cried. A tear breaks Jesus' heart. A tear makes Jesus do wonders. The most precious bribery, the only precious bribery you could ever give Jesus and he will accept is your tears. The only bribe, you can bribe him by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is the only bribery he will accept. And a tear for Jesus is more expensive than pearls, gold, precious stones, you name it. Nothing. Nothing is expensive as the tears. So Mary came and wept. Jesus wept. And he said, show me where you, where you put Lazarus. Show me where you put him. This is not a question that Jesus, he, I mean, like he does not know where, La he knew where Lazarus was. He was not asking. But he was saying, show me where it is. He is trying to point, to raise up in the human race this question that look where you ended up. Wake up, guys. Come back to me. This question is for you, not for me. Because I know where Lazarus is, but I'm asking it for your sake. Where is he? Where have you put him? That means, you guys, where are you ending up? Where have you ended up? I know where you are. I am the good shepherd who lay his, his life for his sheep. That was in chapter 10. That was in the previous chapters, I already said it. I came for Lazarus, I came for the human race. I know where you are, but do you know where you are? Where have you put him? He's in the grave. He's in the grave. And Jesus looked at Mary weeping. He wept. We'll continue this next Friday, God's willing. Where have you laid him? Let's see what Jesus is meaning by that. And what Jesus is going to do, what steps is he going to take in order for Lazarus to get out of that grave? We will know that for next Friday, God's willing. Thank you so much for your attention. May, may God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forevermore. Amen. May the Lord Jesus bless you. And I will see you, God's willing, next Friday for the continuation of the, the sixth line, which is the raising of Lazarus. God bless you.